Cannabis is going to lead the way, I'm telling you. Yeah, we're going to have a flag here, a cannabis flag. Maybe a totem pole. That would be super cool. No, no, why don't yeah. you make a totem pole with cannabis on it? Yeah, because it's going to pave the way. This is how well, we have to tell the story, how it began. And what a story it is. You don't need history books to know that First Nations communities have faced prejudice for hundreds of years, a path which leads to a lack of opportunity and hope. But down at the river's edge with Darwin, I found out that this is a story of triumph in the face of adversity. All of our communities across Canada need the, the economic development. Darwin introduced me to Chief Gladstone of the Shwai First Nation and Bryson, a young, up-and-coming, super talented cultivator. They showed me firsthand how cannabis is becoming a symbol of hope for First Nations communities across Canada. It's about instilling in people a, a sense that they can actually achieve something in this world, that their life doesn't have to be abject poverty and misery. Bryson's 10 out of 10 grandpa stash crop is a fitting dedication to his grandpa and village elder Bob, who paid a heavy price to pave the way for future generations. Hi, I'm Amanda McKay, and this is Growing Exposed. Today we are honored to invite you along as we take an ancient journey into native lands to witness a truly awe-inspiring garden owned by the Shwai First Nation Band. Now this is a journey unlike any other, so pack your bags and get ready to ride because here's what else we have on this edition of Growing Exposed. First, we meet council member Darwin Douglas on the bank of the mighty Fraser River before speeding up the ancient highway from Cham First Nation to Shwai First Nation. We're people of the river. Fishing was our economy for thousands of years, or a big part of our economy and culture and lifestyle. Where we meet village elder Bob and Chief Robert Gladstone, who honors our arrival with a traditional welcome song. After that, it's time to settle in with the Garden Sage for a dose of ancient Kana wisdom. The First Nations people of the planet are really the sacred wisdom keepers of this traditional knowledge. Then we join Chief Robert Gladstone over in the canoe house to talk about the importance of hope. More importantly, and I can't put enough emphasis on this, we've given them hope. Yeah. Next, we catch up with Director of Cultivation, Todd Scarlett, and then it's time to load up the bases because you're about to witness buds the size of baseball bats over in this incredible garden. Like I said, we got no baseball bat. bats in here. Way to knock it out of the park. Now let's join Justin and Darwin to hear what life is like for the Stalo, people of the river. So Darwin, why are we standing beside a river? Yeah, I thought it was important to introduce you guys to Stalo territory in the right way. And Stalo, in our language, which is Halkamalem, Stalo means river. So we're very much river people. Mm -hmm. we, we've always lived here beside the, the Fraser River. You know, the river used to be our highway, uh, up and down, visiting neighboring communities and our relatives. So I thought it was appropriate. We took the old highway down the river to visit our neighbors in Shwai today and give you guys the real view and perspective of what it means to be Stalo. Let's do this. Okay, right, let's go. at the mouth of two rivers. Uh, this is the Harrison and the Fraser meeting. Um, what did these grounds mean for you traditionally? You know, one time this whole river was heavily, heavily populated with Stalo people. Just about anywhere you go up and down the Fraser, you're gonna find an old Stalo village or an archeological site. So yeah, the history runs deep here. And um, I guess in, in some ways we're fortunate, you know, people talk about all the challenges that First Nations communities have, but there's also a real sense of um, pr 
pride in, in our history and, and in our family and in our culture. So that still remains. And, you know, we bring that forward into everything we're doing, right? Even including the, the cannabis facility in Shuai. They had a blessing ceremony and trying to bring that culture and tradition into what we do in the modern world. To so many people on this planet today, they lack tradition, they lack where they came from. So it's nice to see you guys are trying to hold on to that. You know, the bottom line just isn't the net profit for all of us. It's the social impact is equally as important. The jobs, the careers, seeing people train, starting off picking leaves or sweeping the floors up to becoming the master growers. Like that's our hopes and aspirations is to, to, to see that. So it all starts with the seed. It does, yeah, yeah. Well, that's certainly an unconventional way to travel down an ancient highway. Next up, we join the guys as they're greeted by Chief Robert Gladstone of the Shuai First Nation. So Shuai is just around the corner. So uh, I don't know, it's about another, the way Danny drives, maybe uh, five minutes. <laughs> 35 seconds? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Let's go have fun. Get on step here. Those stickers that say hold on. I recommend yeah. holding on. What's going on, Bob? Justin. Chief Gladstone, thank you for having us. Well, we're wonderful to have you here. Welcome to our village. This is uh, beautiful. It's very fitting that you come ashore this way. Uh, in the olden days in our protocol, when we'd have guests into our village, I mean, this was our highway. In ancient times, we had economic systems that were healthy and vibrant and trade from village to village, uh, from nation to nation. And it was reinforced by political structures. And coming ashore just in that little boat that you did there was a very big part of it. And being greeted by our elder was a part of that fiber and, and structure. So it's a yeah. beautiful thing. So welcome to our village. Thank you so much for having us. I'd love to talk to the elder Bob I think that'd about be his history because he also served time for cannabis production. That's right. He paid a high price for cannabis. Yeah. You know, and. Um, in our hearts and minds, we were practicing our Aboriginal rights and title to have access to our medicines that we have since time in memorials. And here's one of our elders who spent several years in jail yeah. uh, for, for, for doing something that today is legal and perfectly accepted, socially acceptable and yeah. legally as well. You know, you knew something long ago. Oh, really? That cannabis helps and enriches lives, helps with pain, ailment. Right. It's a natural plant therapy. That's a really interesting thing is that his mom, the grandmother of this village, she had a little bottle of alcohol, rubbing alcohol, and inside it was always seen green things. And then she would rub it on her hands and everything. They had learned already then that the CBDs and stuff would be extracted through the alcohol being soaked in there. Mm -hmm. She rubbed it in her hands and it was a non-narcotic, non-opiate way of dealing with her severe arthritic pain. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow. So, I mean, you know, th th they were doing this for some time. You know, it's a very interesting. Bryson, Bryson Rabang. Yeah. Yep, he's going to do it for me. Could have been a great baseball player, but <laughs> start smoking marijuana and never went to career. <laughs> <laughs>
It didn't wreck his career. No, no, hey, I watched the way. He was growing baseball bats. <laughs> yeah, he was growing baseball bats. Yeah. So yeah, I'm really proud of him. We're excited to go see what he's capable of doing. Right. And we're excited to see his garden. And you actually did time for it. So right. you. Right. Uh, a lot of our family did. It wasn't only me, there was about a dozen of us went in. They thought wow. we was a big crime family, but we're just <laughs> just doing our thing. We're all marijuana smokers, you know. Yeah. We, you and a whole bunch of people that you're associated with went to jail for something that wasn't wrong. Right. Right? And now to see it turn around, have your grandson working in the industry, that's the story that we want to tell. Oh, it's always been my dream, my dream, my biggest dream, marijuana, when I just brought tears to my eyes to see that marijuana growing like that. Oh, my God. It's going to bring our people up. Our kids could go to college. We can get medical. We'll have our own money. I believe in cannabis. Yeah, and hopefully for other indigenous communities. Yeah. It's really cool to see the Stalo people take the opportunity but showing that this is an opportunity for other First Nations, that this is an economy for the future. Right, right. Before cannabis, what kind of jobs were available? Very little. Okay. Maybe cleaning brush or something like that. Or, Just uh, limited uh, Landscaping, you know, cleaning people's yards, you know, and stuff like that. Yeah. But not what we got now. That's a lot to be proud of. Yeah, I, I pushed for it. Good for you. I wouldn't be here today if yeah. old school didn't pave the way. And everybody kind of, what? You know, at first, no, didn't want to listen about cannabis. Yeah. And look at it now. <laughs> yeah, we got a lot of people working. People are happy. Some want to make it their career. You know, they're really interested in it, you know? That's something to be proud of. I'm very proud. <laughs> Bryson's uh, becoming a hell of a cultivator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yep. Thanks, Bob. Okay, thank you. The peaceful, hypnotic rhythm of that welcome song is certainly a hard act to follow. But luckily for you, up next, we have the Garden Sage with his thoughts on ancient plant medicine. Throughout humanity's struggle to survive, the cornerstone of human health care has been plant medicines. Really, it has spawned the entire medical system that we see today, which is new. However, humanity's use of plant medicines is not new. Its age is untold old and proven. Now, the First Nations people of the planet are really the sacred wisdom keepers of this traditional knowledge. And it has never been so important to recognize and record, honor, and use this knowledge for our own health, healing, and empowerment. I myself have benefited from plant medicines from a young age. And even in my adult life, I have taken journeys to heal through plant medicine and the guidance of indigenous cultures. Pivotal turning points in my life have come from these efforts. So the First Nations people need to be regarded. Their presence in the cannabis industry is of crucial importance and they're going to contribute a magnitude of wealth to this industry. When I started this over 10 years ago, I was growing it and harvesting it. But nobody was really talking about what was going on inside this plant. Outside, you'll see plant material, which is primarily carbon and water. And it's only after a closer look, you discover this beautiful world of trichomes. And it's here that you find the substance which gives cannabis the effect that it has. Now that I know it's all about trichome production, I use resin. Try it, you're gonna be blown away. Now 
let's join Justin and Chief Robert Gladstone in the Canoe House to hear about how cannabis has become a beacon of hope for the community. So these are the canoes. They are, they're beautiful. These three canoes represent the three sisters of our tribe, the three elders. Mm -hmm. They were all basket weavers and storytellers. They were the language holders and they were the history, the knowledge keepers of the reserve. This whole village was once covered in Western red cedar and people used to come from all over the valley here to build their canoes. The word Shwai, the name of our village, was meant to ads, which meant to, to dig out the material from the trees. And we wanted to return to our, our, our roots. We wanted to return to our origins. We wanted to anchor ourselves in who we were. We still had that understanding. So we planted over 8,000 trees in the village. And then we wanted to restore ourselves to our heritage. We were known as canoe makers. And this is with that cedar that was grown that's the unfortunate thing is that you can't find what we call heritage trees anymore. So we had to go up in the valley, but even then we couldn't get trees large enough to do this. So if you look closely, you'll see that there's strips. Okay. So what we did is we got the most straightest trees that we Super could get. Super tight grain. That's it. And we milled them yep. and we stripped them out. And then we started on a frame and we built them to look and resemble the, the shape of the old canoes, but we used a little bit of modern techniques. So it's still Western red cedar. And important thing about that is the Western red cedar in our culture is one of the most powerful elements. Um, we use it for uh, making baskets, we use it for building buildings, but we used it for medicine too. The belief is that the spirit within that is powerful and it's protective and it's healing. So it gave us the ability to build these wonderful canoes. And again, I'll just say is it was just returning to who and what we were. So how exciting has it been for the last four years you had four people employed four years ago, full-time gainfully employed, and today you have over 100 on the reserve. When I was a young man, I used to wake up, and I think we all can relate to this, I used to wake up excited about the day. I used to be excited when I went to sleep thinking about tomorrow and the possibilities of tomorrow. It was a hope. It was a belief that we could do something better mm -hmm. and change the fabric of the lives of our people. So. When you ask me how it feels and what it means to me, it's the greatest feeling. We had people that were destitute. Uh, I used to tell my one nephew, you know, there were some people that would look forward to getting their welfare check once a month just so they can go to McDonald's and that was their treat. It's about instilling in people a, a sense that they can actually achieve something in this world, that their life doesn't have to be abject poverty and misery. So that business down there, the grow operation, it's not just a building. I said, it's a spiritual vehicle, just like these canoes. Mm -hmm. and, and it's changed the standard of living. We have people that never had a job before in their life. Mm -hmm. They're now going to work every day. They're owning cars. They're getting driver's license. They're fixing up their homes. They're excited. They're providing for their children. Yeah. They're going on trips. And, and But more importantly, and I say this all the time, more importantly, and I can't put enough emphasis on this, we've given them hope. Yeah. We've given them a belief that the world can change. You've taught them to fish. They already taught you them to fish. You haven't given them fish. I love that. I yeah. love that. Yeah. I love that. I love that. Like exactly. That, that to me, early days of cannabis, when I was 17, 18, 19, I was in the industry. I'm an old man now. But this was the vehicle that gave me hope. It's one of the reasons why I pay homage towards it. It was what I ended up doing and decided to do with my life. And for young people to, to recognize that there's hope within your village, I can't imagine the pride that that brings. It's a good legacy for anyone. And the wonderful thing about it, I, I need to keep saying this, it's not just my legacy. It's the Shwai Village uh, Chief and Council and its administration success, and ultimately our, our people's success. Yeah, well, we met Bryson. A wonderful man. Really nice kid. I can't wait to go actually see the garden. It's beautiful. Because it was a long journey to, to, to get licensed. The one thing that we stressed to the government, we said, we're not asking for a handout. Yeah. We're asking for an even playing field. Yeah. Treat us as equals. Treat us as equals. I mean, that's, that's, that's all we ask. But there is a willingness at many levels for us to negotiate government to government working relationships, and they're bearing fruit, and I'm proud of it. I sh you really should be. It should set a stage for the indigenous people to say, hey, we can be a part of this. I love that. We're pioneering the trail. And uh, this has been a, a big piece of that, and I'm proud of that as well. Yeah. 
Robert, it's truly a pleasure. Yeah, and, great. Uh, I appreciate you opening the doors to us. Wonderful. Thank you for being here. It's a real honor. Thank you. After visiting the canoe house, Chief Gladstone took me to the village longhouse, a place of worship where people of the community go to sing and practice spiritual ceremonies. Normally, it would be an open space, but due to a recent devastating wildfire in the neighboring village of Lytton, a welcoming center has been established to gather and distribute donations to those that have been affected. I was completely blown away and left thinking that if the nurturing spirit of the Shwai volunteers is an indication of what's to come, then I have very high hopes for this garden. So where does a fish keep his money? Where? The riverbank. Why are we friends again? I own the boat. That's right. I need to buy a boat. Don't post that anywhere. I called in sick today. Look! Holy smoke. You may have just captured the most important discovery of our time. Reports are now coming in about the story of the two fishermen who captured an unbelievable video. Launching our own investigation using sophisticated software, we confirm what appears to be Green Planet's backcountry blend intended as an economical choice for outdoor growers. This granular nutrient system is designed to be broadcasted across your outdoor crop. Feed less with great results. Maybe not the breaking news you expected, but certainly is good news. Well, we've been on a jet boat, we've heard some music, and we've had a proper history lesson. So there's only one thing left to do. It's time to check out this groundbreaking garden. So Todd, my understanding is this facility is all indigenous owned mm -hmm. and indigenous run. Yeah, so there are other cannabis companies operating within Canada that are more or less, I mean, you know, not to throw mud or whatever, but they're saying we're an indigenous company. Mm -hmm. But really, we are truly indigenous. So um, I have been hired on as a you know, consultant for the company. I work directly for the business. We've completed phase one, which we're actually standing in you know, now, which is 17,000 square feet of cultivation. We've got three 91 light flower rooms built out. Most of our employees here at this facility actually come directly from the Shwai First Nation. Mm -hmm. um, and as they move up in the organization, they become a grower. And being a grower, you have your own grow space to take care of. Um, Bryson is one of our you know, guys who's running his own grow room because he's very dedicated, uh, he's very intelligent, and um, we're gonna be seeing his grow room here today. Super. How cool is it that you're actually giving opportunity, and not only employment, but you're actually giving them a full grow room to say, here, this is your baby, this is your responsibility, mm -hmm do something fantastic. Yeah, you know, give somebody some responsibilities and they're not just showing up to work anymore. And when they get to see the whole process right from, oh, these are my clones that I helped make and I was a part of this. These are my vegetative plants and I've raised these, you know, now they're going into a room that I'm running right from day one of flower to harvest. It all becomes meaningful, you know. Yeah, very, makes, very all, empowering. Yeah, it all makes sense, right? And, and you know, when we first started here in this building, nobody here had any cultivation experience. Now, if I'm not here for a week, the phone might ring a few times, but the people running these rooms are really doing quite an amazing job where they're almost out on their own and I'm here from a, you know, to a more of a support standpoint. In the design and construction of this building, the whole idea was if I'm gonna build something and it's gonna be legal and we're gonna be able to stay there forever, because let's face it, all those older cannabis sites where we learned from in the beginning, they all had an expiry date. Well, this thing's permanent, right? Mm -hmm. So the idea was to build this thing as best as we possibly could right from the start yeah. and make it perfect. And I think that's what we've done here. From what I've seen so far, mm -hmm. looks pretty damn perfect. I can't wait to see more of the garden. I'll take you through. Beautiful, let's go. Here it is. Glasses. Check. Garden, let's go. Here we go. This is the baby room. This is where they all start. So the key to this is you gotta make sure they're healthy. If these are sick, 
you end up with sick plants all the way through. And we do not want sick plants. So this is all MAC-1 in here. Okay, and for those that don't know, MAC stands for Miracle Alien Cookies. Yep. What THC content are you guys putting out of that one? I want to say like 30%. 30%, that's a strong THC. Yeah. I mean, anything 30 and above, you're, yeah. you're killing it. Yep, definitely. Okay. Yeah, so you guys are running LED full spectrum uh, sun blasters in here. Yep. I noticed you're also running um, seedling heat mats. Yep. This is a good idea to make sure that the roots are nice and warm, obviously. The worst thing you can do for cuttings is actually have a cold ground that they're on. Shock them before they even go into the next room. <laughs> yeah. And those are your roots. So that's really fast. Yeah, 9 to 14 days, they start rooting. Yeah. They're looking good. And really, really healthy. Let's take this out right now. I really like the Easy Plugs. They're, uh, they, you know, they work well. It's convenient if you want to make a lot of clones at once. Like if you have the little grotting cubes, you're going to make little cuts like here and there. But this, you could just get all your cuts, put them in a little solution. Yeah. Plug them in. Looks fantastic. So um, from here, let's go check out the veg. One of the things I love is you've got a Hydro-X Pro. I love the Hydro-X Pro. This is actually showing and, and data logging. This is everything. actually the human brain of yeah. what's going on in the room. So we got our VPD right here, which yeah. is ideal for What's going on right now? 0.91. Yep. And then our air temp is at 28.1 Celsius. Yeah. Humidity is at 76. CO2 is at 808. Like it's pretty mint. Doesn't awesome. can't get any better than that. If it can, we're working on it. <laughs> Perfect. Let's go check out the plants. Let's go check them out. The mist, the mist. So you got an ideal air uh, humidifier. Yes, we do. Keep it nice and yeah. humid in here. Really important to use distilled water through these and not city water because you end up with a cloud of calcium on everything. Definitely. And these are the uh, veg, your, this is your pre-veg This basically. is all grandpa stash. This is all grandpa stash. This will be my next run and this is the run that I've been perfecting. The plants look super healthy, great air movement. You can really feel in a grow room if this is the right ideal environment. And I can tell right off the get, you have dialed in this environment perfectly. I also really like the fact that you're growing in Rockwell cubes. I really think Rockwell cubes are fantastic. I love it. You're growing in a four by four cube, great roots. And one of the things I like is plants that finish at two and a half, three feet tall. So you're flipping these at about a foot, foot and a half tall. Yeah. Really important. An important other fact is the stalks, as a plant gets older and older, become more and more woody. Yeah. On a six foot, eight foot, 10 foot tall plant, that stalk may be this big, the caliber may be this big, but it's very woody and it doesn't allow nutrients to flow through it very quickly. The size of plant you're doing, yeah. the nutrients flow very fast. Yeah. So the flower sites can develop faster and you can get that, the faster flow of nutrients. It also takes more time to get nutrients from the medium to eight feet high. Definitely. Right? Definitely. So by having a shorter plant, those nutrients are being more bioavailable faster and they, it, it, that highway on a green stalk yeah. flows so much faster. Makes so total sense. Yeah, so I think you're doing great things here. Thank you. You're growing on GGS tables. You've got Gavita lights. Yep. Wind socks for great air movement through your air conditioners. You've kind of got everything dialed in. Yeah, I take a lot of pride in my work, that's for sure. Proof is in the pudding. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go check out the big room. All right, let's go to grow room two. Uh, one thing I really like, Bryson, is uh, every room you have these mats in front of. Yeah. They're basically designed to pick up all the particulate on your shoes. Yeah, pick up all the hair, dust, bugs, whatever you have on your shoes, it's picked it up. <laughs> yeah, and on top of that, you have redundancies. This is the backup. This is the backup. This literally is... That's good to see. Picking up everything. So. Right out of the gate, you've got a six inch uh, grow down slab. Yep. You've taken your four by four cube and put it right on that slab. Yes, and you've got know. two drip emitters per cube. Yep. Really nice, very commercial setup. Now you guys are gonna transition to LED, I heard. Yes. LED is really a uh, technology that's up and coming and performing really, really well. More energy efficient and designed to actually uh, give a better spectrum than a lot of the HPS light. Hydro bill goes down a little bit. <laughs> Hydro bill goes down a bit, your AC bill goes down a little bit, but very, very important, way less heat. Beautiful. Yeah, every single corner of this garden is clean. It's just so we don't ever have to deal with bugs or powder mildew or anything that could cause us troubles in the long run. They always say that ounce of prevention is a pound of cure. Definitely. So these girls look very stripped. Yeah, they just got stripped, so. Yeah. Day one defoliating just happened a week ago, 
and then yeah. they'll have another lease trip on week week three, week four. Okay. And then that's it for a lease trip. And okay. after that, it's just canopy management. Let them go. Let them go and let them flower. Beautiful. Yep. So how big a deal is it being an indigenous person, being able to grow cannabis legally? It's more than just a big deal. We got people from our community coming to the facility, wanting to work, work with plants, and they don't have to go landscape or fishing to make money now. They can come here, enjoy their job, and love life. Beautiful. How many indigenous people work at this facility? 15 plus. Wow. And we're talking about fishing as a seasonal occupation. Fish stocks are in decline and the use of cannabis is on an incline. So this is long-term sustainable business. Definitely, and a lot of people in our community, they live off the fishing season and we haven't had fishing season. So now we have a business in our community that could help everybody out. It's gotta be something that you're really proud of. I'm very proud of it. <laughs> very cool. Flower room number two. Here we go. Let's go. Sticky pads work great. Yeah, those sticky pads are fantastic. Yeah, they are. So, wow. Grandpa stash. Grandpa stash is looking really, really good. You got great trichome production, great trellis management. I can't really uh, pick this apart. This is really looking good. What week are we on here? This is week seven. Week seven. So stacking up really, really well. Yeah. Any tips you have for uh, people? If it's not dry, do not apply. Yeah. That's like the goal. Like you really want to let it dry out so those roots are just like stretching, looking for that dryness. And then like if your pH is a little high on the runoff, just put some pH down into your reservoir and yeah. correct Compensate it. for it, exactly. exactly. Yeah, it's so important to measure runoff. Definitely. And you're entirely right. If it's not dry, don't apply. Yeah. You have to let plants dry out effectively. Not to the point of wilting, but just before. Yeah, because if you don't let it dry out, you're gonna start getting stems in here that start turning woody. And you run into so many problems with potential pythium and all these fusarium, these root diseases, that a novice grower would be over watering and, and killing them with kindness. Over watering, then you got algae everywhere yeah. and it's just... It's very problematic. So Definitely. it's a great tip uh, for any uh, new grower. Make sure you get your irrigation cycles down pat. Definitely. If your recipe is perfect and your parts per million is perfect, you're going to have healthy plants. You just don't overfeed them. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. But How do you, you like resin? Resin works really good. And terpenator I've actually used. You're mixing resin and terpenator. Yeah. They work actually pretty well in conjunction. They do the same thing, but they do it in two different modes of action. Yeah. I don't use them in the beginning of flower, but like coming into like week four to week eight, I, I feed them resin and terpenator just Honestly. to get that terpene production to go nuts. And the, and the plants do genuinely, the smell in the room changes. Everything changes about really the does. smell. So that makes me really happy to hear. <laughs> but, uh, What's the other room we're going to go look at? We're going to go look at another room of grandpa stash, and we got baseball bats literally everywhere. Big dogs everywhere. Let's go check those Let's girls out. Let's go check out. them out. <laughs> Holy crap. We have buds in here hanging. They're just hanging out, chilling for the last two weeks of flushing and then harvest. The way these girls are stacked up, I mean, literally, they are hanging out. They're literally, there's some girth and some weight. How far along are we here? Like how many more days until crop? Two weeks until we harvest. Two weeks, so we still have two weeks to stack on here. In a lot of grow rooms, these look finished. Yep. But the fact is, 95% of those pistols are all still white. White. So you've stacked yourself up for a very serious harvest here. I'm thinking four pounds. Four pounds I for think, life. I think that's highly possible. One of the things I like about this garden is that this falls kind of in between the licensed producer and the craft grower. Yeah. This garden isn't so huge that you've lost the attention to detail. And uh, Bryson, you give a shit. And that's really, I hope that the viewer, that gets translated because, you know, it takes some people years and years. So you've had great tutelage and you've had access to good information mm -hmm. because to pull off a crop that's even nearing four pounds of light. Yeah is a fucking massive undertaking. Definitely. And it's all about sacrifice. You really gotta put the time, the hours, into being with your plants. You can't just come in here and feed your plants, okay, I'm gone. You really gotta be in your room at all times, knowing yeah. what's going on from this row to that row to the very last row. You wanna know what every plant is doing. Yeah. And if there's nutrient deficiencies going on, you wanna be able to correct it right away. Yeah. You gotta get right on top of it immediately. And Definitely. That's, that's one of the things I really like. Plants talk to you. They definitely do. And 
when you're able to identify any potential problems, you can get ahead of them so much faster. You have no bud rot, you have no powdery mildew, you have no root disease, you have no insects. You've knocked it out of the park. Good for you. Thank you. Fucking awesome. <laughs> Let's get deeper into the room. Let's go. Now this looks incredible. Just look at the size of that nugget. And they're, they're, I have extra large hands. I've got really big hands. That is a big, big, big nug. White pistols everywhere. They're still growing. Two weeks of flushing. And you obviously scope your trikes? Yeah, I do. Yeah. How do the uh, trichomes look right now? Right now, they're not really where I want to be, but after the two weeks, I think they're going to be super milky to the point where you can't, all you see is crystal. But yeah, right now, they're, they're milking up. Yeah, they're still mostly clear. Mostly clear, but after the two weeks, I think they're going to get milky. You've got a great future in cannabis, Bryson. Thank you. Because Three years in coming, and I'm only here for the long run. Yeah. I don't uh, normally give compliments like this, but you're, you're fucking killing it in this room. Thank you. First crop, yeah. first harvest from a indigenous community, we're actually looking at it. That's yep. a big deal. So it's safe to say, come into a store near you. Definitely. We hit grand slams over here. You're going to sell out pretty quickly, I can tell you that. I, I, th I think, you know, that's a good looking harvest. It's not often on the show you actually you can say that's a 10 out of 10 room. That's awesome. But right now, like we, we pushed these lights to 120%. Yeah. And now we're in the flushy stage. We've kicked them back down to 90%. Yeah. So we can get this room nice and cool. And within these two weeks of flushing, hopefully we start seeing more colors out of here. Hopefully we yeah. start getting maybe like a little bit of purple, yeah. fall colors start Where popping out. Temperature down in? I want to bring it down to like 60 degrees in here, yeah. Fahrenheit. Yeah. Nice and cool. Nice and cool. Borderline too cool. Yeah. It's gonna be a fridge. Yeah, I want it nice and cool in here so yeah. we could pretty much shock them to get that fall color. Yeah. yeah. So now it's about color and final trichome production. Definitely. So on that note, this is the first indigenous crop about to come down and you guys knocked it out of the park. So Bryson, thank you. Real true pleasure to meet you. Nice to meet you too. And uh, thank you for giving us the tour. Cheers. Awesome. Well, folks, we hope you've enjoyed this spiritual journey as much as we have. As always, you can check out past episodes, interviews, and how-tos at growingexposed.com. And we love to connect on social media, so hit us up if you've got any questions or suggestions. Until next time, I'm Amanda McKay, and this grow has been exposed. Ooh.